Welcome to Prison Professors. I am Michael Santos, and today I am introducing you to Jonathan Barber. It's somebody that if you're in the California Department of Corrections, you may have come across at one time or another. He's an incredibly inspiring guy because he's used his time in prison to prepare for a really successful outcome, and he inspires me. I'm sure he's going to inspire you. So Jonathan, thanks so much for taking this time on a Sunday morning to spend with our Prison Professors program. How are you doing today? I'm doing awesome. Uh, Michael, thank you for inviting me to do this interview. I really appreciate it. And I hope that the viewers get something out of our interview. Well, they're going to definitely get, get something from it because everybody who's serving time in a jail or a prison always gets inspired when they get to hear about somebody who came out of the other side successfully and nobody has come out more successfully than you have. So, so if you could just give us a little background to let us know what brought you into the criminal justice system and where you served your time. So things that resulted in me developing a criminal mentality and addictive mentality was in essence, just to say it in a pretty general sense, was just, I was a scary individual. What I mean by that was I had a lot of insecurities going on. And the way that I dealt with my insecurities was I was looking for external validation, either through uh, negative peer association, um, money, women, cars. That was the way that I, I earned my value. And ultimately, I was willing to seek out those things at any cost. Um, because I was a selfish individual. Now, with that being said, what ultimately happened was not only did I gather uh, an extensive criminal record, I also ended up killing a woman while driving impaired, which was um, very unfortunate and a tragedy. It had a, uh, a huge ripple effect, not only for her, her family, but also the community that she was a part of. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. I know that that that's, can be a heavy burden to carry for so long. How old were you when that happened? I just turned 24. And how many times have you been in the prison system before that? So I, I did two times in the county jail. I've never been to the prison system. So when I caught this life case and was ultimately um, sentenced, that was the first time that I ended up in CDCR's custody. So you were 24 years old. It was your first time in prison. And did you just say that the judge sentenced you to a life term? Well, let me back up a little bit. So because I was operating with this victim mentality that the world is happening to me, I fought this criminal case for five years while in county. So I was um, refusing to accept responsibilities. I pushed the prosecution to the edge. Um, I made them ultimately take me to trial. I was justly found guilty and sentenced accordingly. So by the time I went to prison, it was actually five years later. So I was about 29 years old. So when you, you said that you, in the beginning, you pushed the government to the test or the state to the prosecutor to the test or all the way to the end, was there an opportunity at one point for you to accept a, a plea agreement that could have been a, a less onerous sentence? No, no. Um, the, the, the DA was unwilling to prosecute, and I understand exactly why. I believe that was the right decision. Um, when I was originally charged, I was charged with a lesser sentence, but once again, because I was operating with this victim mentality like poor as me, I was unwilling to step up to the plate and just say guilty. So they, because of that selfish attitude, they were like, okay, well, we're going to charge you with murder. And at that point, I tried to play um, legal games and was hoping to hold out for a deal. Um, and that never happened. So when, what was the original charge? Manslaughter? Gross vermicular manslaughter. And what was the potential exposure at that level? You mean how, how long was the sentence? What would, it, what would it have been had you accepted responsibility very early at the journey and, not, and, and taken that route? So it's a maximum 10 years. So if they were to max me out, I would have got the 10 years. It's possible they could have put a hit and run enhancement, which would have been another five. So that could have been uh, 15. But the irony was because I never had an actual prison prior strike, I would have been eligible for halftime. So I ultimately probably could have got out with about five to seven years. 
the reason I'm, I'm pushing you so much to get that information is because this, this program also goes into a lot of jails where people are, are contemplating how to respond. And certainly I don't give any legal advice, but I do think it's relevant for people to hear from individuals who, who made some bad decisions at the charging stage like I did. I got 45 years in prison because I was not willing to accept responsibility very early on. And it sounds like that's what happened to you. And, and, and the judge then sentenced you to life in prison. Is that right? Yeah. And, and as the years went on and I understood the gravity and the significance of it because I understood the significance of a life sentence attached to me. When I first started this whole little legal maneuvering, I was all like, OK, I'm not taking anything more than four years. That's it. By the time we were getting to trial, like the weeks up, um, I was so petrified of actually walking away with the life sentence. I was telling my attorney, like, man, just go in there. I'll sign 25. I'll sign 30. Just give me a flat uh, sentence. And even with that, the DA was like, no. So, so you got the life sentence. And what was the mindset that you had when you went into the prison system with a life sentence? Um, I, w I was cautiously hopeful and at the same time I was terrified because I, I did not know how this was going to play out. I knew I wanted to find ways to rehabilitate myself, not only on an uh, educational level, but also on a personal rehabilitative level. Um, and at the same time, I was still acting with a lot of my character defects. So I was trying to figure out how could I walk two lines in the essence, like take care of these rehabilitative needs, but at the same time, seek out my external validations from the criminal elements inside prison. So I guess we'll get there. I'm going to jump a little bit ahead and I'll come back to this section. But I noticed in the beginning of our interview today, you took some time to really express um, empathy. And, and remorse for, for the person who died. I heard you say that you, that you felt awful about it and, and then there were consequences, not only of course for her and for, for you, but, but for the victim's family as well. When did it, did it become very important for you? At what stage for you to, instead of looking at your own challenges, look at what happened with the victim? At what stage in your journey did that take place? So it took, it took a significant amount of time after the actual murder. And the reason being is five years after the murder itself, I was still fighting the criminal justice system. So at that point, I was unwilling to really look at how it affected them. I was more concerned with how am I going to be affected? So it was a few years after that conviction and I was sent up to CDCR that I started noticing um, how there were significant life moments that were going on, not only that, I, that were going on in my friends and family's life and things that I was missing. And a light clicked on because the, the innocent woman who I ended up killing, her children were my same age. So I, I started to understand, I was all like, all these significant life moments that I'm missing, my friends are celebrating, these kids are going through it and they don't have their mother with them their mother's not being able to celebrate them with them. And that's when it started to click on it. And that's when I was all like, hold up, I need to figure out some ways to truly make some type of amends. Jonathan, you, I noticed that you used the, the word murder. And I know that that's a legal term. But was it, was, is that how you see it at this stage? Because it, it was, sounds like it was a, an accident. It was you were driving. And why, why do you use the term murder? And I'm not questioning you, I'm just curious. At this stage, you call it a murder and, and what actually happened? Because it sounded to me like it was an accident, a driving accident. So hands down, I will never call this an accident. It was an auto collision in the sense that, yes, my car collided with someone else. Now, on the legal uh, aspect, it's called murder because it's ultimately they, they prove implied malice, meaning that I had knowledge beforehand that my actions were dangerous. And because of that, I still acted with that knowledge meaning there was a conscious disregard um and that's true that's true i I'm, i knew driving impaired was dangerous i it's it is advocated throughout 
the nation on uh, an array of different social media and uh, different mainstream uh, mediums. So to sit here and say like, oh, I didn't know that this was a dangerous act would be just a whole bunch of hubris. So um, I knew what I was doing for a long time. I was driving around every day, either high off of marijuana, or if it was the weekend, it would be high off marijuana, alcohol, and or an array of other party drugs. So I knew what I was doing. I've been in collisions um, before, yet I continue to do it. And because of that, I was callous, I was selfish, and ultimately it, it was a murder. I'm really sorry to, ha- to hear that, you're, that you have to live with that. I hope that some of our audience um, who are in jail or maybe going back into society, they take uh, a real message, a real takeaway from that. And that's how dangerous it is to be uh, getting behind the, the wheel of a vehicle while you're uh, under the influence of some type of drug, because it could lead to a life sentence in prison. And, and I'm sorry that you had to go through that, Jonathan, but it's super impressive the way that you responded. Why don't you tell our audience um, what kind of facilities you had to serve that sentence when you began? So I, I was in Orange County Jail for five years, as I mentioned. After that, I went up to Susanville, which is in Susanville County. I'm sorry, Lassen County, next to Reno. I was up there for about two and a half years. And is then, that a level four institution? No, that, that's a level three. So you're in a level three uh, prison, high security prison. And how was your adjustment at Susanville for those two and a half years? I would say I, I have had a lot of serendipitous experiences in the sense that I have came across people who have given me some positive advice. And when I was at my best, I listened to it. I was able to actually find value in it and, and profit. So when, when I went to Susanville, um, I, I came across one in, uh, individual in particular who he stressed the importance of go to school and help others and stay off the yard. So when I would, when I would adhere to that advice, I would stay out of trouble. Um, when, when I wanted to act on my own uh, intuition, that's usually when I got into trouble. Um, so it was, it, Susanville was beneficial and at the same time, um, there were situations that I could have avoided if I was acting more wisely um, 24-7. A lot of people go into the prison system and think that the, the, they have to run with a culture or run with the mindset of the penitentiary. Um, and it sounds like you saw a pathway to be more productive. Um, and and, and you, ha- you, you knew a pathway to be productive, but that didn't mean you always took the pathway to be more productive. What were some of the complications that followed when you chose to participate in the yard or, or do something that wasn't as productive as maybe you should have been doing? Well, the, the most clear consequence was when I went to my initial board hearing and we got through the conversation about my life case. Then they brought up confidential information. Uh, For those who don't know what confidential information is, that could be any kind of documentation that had been uh, gathered by someone. It could be custody staff or uh, an incarcerated person uh, dropped information saying that you were doing something criminal. So when I went to my initial board hearing and we got to this section of the hearing, and they asked about it. Of course, when they do, they don't give you specifics. It's a very, very general inquiry. Um, this was when I reverted back to my victim mentality. Like, and in my mind, I'm all like, what are these people talking about? This is, this is so long ago. I don't even know why we're even talking about it. I'm not this person now. And all this internal conversation prevented me from actually accounting for my criminal behavior while I was incarcerated and I got denied. So that was the most, that was the most clear example of how my behavior impacted me. And what stage were you eligible for parole? How many years in? So 
Um, when I came in and I was sentenced as a lifer, I had to do 100% of my time. So I didn't, I, I was not eligible for any credit. So when you do 100% of your time, excuse me, I was sentenced to 15 years to life. They send you to the parole board a year before. So I went to the parole board on my 14th year. If I was fortunate enough to uh, satisfy the commissioners that I was suitable, I would have walked out at 15 years. So this was the, my 14th year of incarceration when this occurred. I see. And, and you're saying that the confidential information that was presented had to do with the, some of the bad decisions you made at the very start of your journey. At Susanville. Started my journey in prison. Yeah. So that's a very important takeaway is that if somebody's listen, watching this show and you're inside of a jail or you're inside of a prison, don't think that, you, that, that you're going to turn your life around several years later and you're going to get the benefit of that. There are so many people like Jonathan Barber who come onto our program and talk with us about the initial adjustment and how that later hangs over their head uh, for many years later and, 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 and complicates their ability to get out of prison. Now, now, did you serve all of your sentence, Jonathan, in level threes, or did you end up going to level fours or lower? Well, let me answer one thing about what you just said a second ago. So Please. now here's the truth of the matter. Because so many of us had went to jail at a younger age, um, meaning that we were incarcerated in the 90s, early 2000s, um, that we did some stupid things. We were criminal and we tried to fit in with those elements. Now, if I was forthright, if I was willing to fall on the sword and be accountable in that initial parole hearing, meaning that I was truthful and I was throwing everything out on the table, I'm 100% sure the commissioners would have let me out because I was unwilling to account for that. And it seemed like I was sidestepping and I was trying to manipulate the situation and by not accounting for it the parole board ultimately rules you were still acting in a criminal fashion, hence you're not suitable. Because I know guys who did actually fall on the sword their initial with a rap sheet and got out. It's one of the reasons that we, that on all of our coursework here at Prison Professors, we really talk about the importance of defining success and saying what's important to your life and then set really clear goals and then kind of document the journey because to the extent that you can show you you've architected your pathway toward reconciliation and redemption you put yourself in a better position to get the outcome at the at the soonest possible time um but you were you were you told us that you did two and a half years at susanville what other institutions did you go to from there so after i i dropped down to a level two I was uh, eligible and I was transferred to CTF and Soledad. Was um, that right after uh, Susanville then? Correct. And this is another example of how my journey was kind of serpendipitous in the sense that um, one major reason that me procrastinating in the county was um, serpendipitous was by the time I went to CDCR, um, they changed the way that they classified new intake. So prior to me getting to CDCR, lifers were going, or individuals who were sentenced to life were automatically sent to a level four. However, this, this summer spring that I ended up going to CDCR, they just reconfigured them. And when they did my classification, I actually didn't qualify for level four. And that wouldn't have happened if I actually was uh, uh, sent there a few years earlier. So that was very serendipitous um, because I really don't know what would have happened if I went to a level four, especially with my mentality of seeking uh, validation from outside uh, uh, sources. I'm fairly confident I probably would have raised my hand for a lot of stuff that really would have complicated um, how the possibilities of me getting out. There are so many people that make that, that kind of um, decision and without really understanding how important it is. If a person wants to come home from prison, a person needs to start sowing seeds that will help them get there. Uh, sometimes opportunities open, like happened with Jonathan. In my case, that, that wasn't an option. I had to do all the, the, the entire sentence 
Um, so, you know, it, but you never know. The, what, you, what I do know is that if, if a person is, is focused on success and focused on building a record, at least you put yourself in a better category, a better possibility of even going from a level three to a level two. Why don't you tell our audience a little bit about how you felt the stress level change when you went from a three to a two? So one of the, one of the first conversations I had when I got to level two created the internal freedom that I needed to really double down on my rehabilitative process and authentically look out for personal growth. And that conversation basically went like this. This is a, this is a yard that has a lot of old timers, guys who have life and sentences. They're trying to get out. Everyone's doing them. They're not worried about other people. So just do you. And by me hearing just do you, that was kind of like, oh, I don't have to adhere to prison politics no more. The, the, the culture that we self-impose on our, ourselves as uh, incarcerated individuals. Oh, all of a sudden, I don't need to do that. I could just do what I deem is most important. And when I was given that permission, unfortunately, I had to hear it from someone else rather than actually just giving myself that permission. But I'm grateful because it it gave me the space to, for me to be like, you know what? All right, let's get, let's get serious. Let's get to work. And how did your adjustment um, evolve at that point? What did you do? Once again, this was, uh, this was one of these serendipitous things. So uh, a lot of the, the pro social people who I met at Susanville happened to get transferred down to, to, to Solidad. And that meant that I had a very positive support network already there. And I tapped into it and I doubled down. So as soon as I got there, I volunteered to be a college uh, tutor. Um, I started getting involved in the college program at our, at our yard at the time. It was called the Higher Education Learning Project Help. Um, and that was like my real first um, experience of like giving back to the community. And, and at that point, I, I just took off and running. So pretty much besides working from eight to three, from four to eight o'clock, I would be doing some type of self-help group. And what were the most effective self-help groups that you found while you were in uh, going through that, this, this serving this life sentence? So a uh, post-secondary education, so college education, although that doesn't technically classify as self-help group, Hands down, that was important for me. I had the fortune of having the support of my family, so I was able to not only uh, utilize the resources to get associate's degrees, um, I was able to um, ultimately get a bachelor's and also a master's while I was incarcerated. So that was something that was very important to me because it got me preoccupied and it kept my um, it kept up me strengthening my, my mental capacity. Now, besides that, Toastmasters was helpful because um, I had been so long in the county jail, I allowed my vernacular to, to, to disintegrate that when I opened my mouth, it was a whole bunch of profanity and slang. So Toastmasters was important because it, it allowed me to redevelop a professional language where I can articulate my thoughts clearly rather than gravitating towards slang or profanity. Um, working with HELP, the Higher Education Learning Project, that transformed into a group called Phoenix Alliance and it was something where we really focused on transformational coaching. So uh, understanding how to be authentic in our, in our every encounter, how, how can we strengthen our intentionality, meaning like we are clear and we have integrity where we are trying to uphold our commitments at all time, um, that was that was important, and also help help expose this notion of having a victim mentality, where things are happening to us versus the fact that we have the the freedom to uh, shape our perspective where it's conducive to our vision, um, and then also Silanala, which was a cultural group, because I'm a very strong advocate in, in social justice and being a, a person of a, a multi uh, cultural and ethnic uh, diversity, like being able to celebrate diversity was important. So that was another group and that helped me get into social justice um, ventures. So 
those those are some of the ones that stood out. Um, ultimately, I was a part of a cohort where it was other men who were convicted of the same crime, and we developed a, a group called Responsibly Driven. Um, I was able to uh, uh, write and edit a testimonial book that we have published. We're currently wor working on a curriculum where we're trying to focus in, in and tailor um, a more effective curriculum to prevent um, impaired, impaired driving. So th those are some of the groups that are really important to me. Did you have opportunities to learn from programs that profiled other formerly incarcerated people like we are doing right now, where you're, people are going to be learning from you in jails and prisons? And, and if so, tell me a little bit about how those types of programs, what influence those kinds of programs had on you? Well, so I was introduced to you from my friend Angelo when he, he came across your first book. And he was very hyped up. He, he loved your book. He was all like, we need to get you in here. And unfortunately, we couldn't, we couldn't develop it. We tried to. If I would have gotten the message, I would have definitely gone. Because I go to a lot of prisons. The funny thing is, when I go into prisons, a lot of times people don't know who I am. And they say, ah, oh, that fool was never in prison. You know, and I say, you think you're giving me an insult because I don't look hard enough. But that was the plan is that, you know, I wanted to get out of prison and, and, and be able to function out here. And, and that's why I like to profile people like you to show people um, that you don't have to get into this mentality of, of becoming a part of the penitentiary. You can start thinking about how you want to emerge. Right, because uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think it was Last Mile. I, I know your book was Earning Freedom, but was it, it was it something called Last Mile? Well, Last Mile is another program that started by uh, a, a guy by the name of Chris Redlitz who started it down in San Quentin. And I know Chris and his wife, Beverly, and a lot of the people. Do you know Kenyatta Leal? No, I do not. So Kenyatta, uh, these are all guys from CDCR. They started a program in San Quentin that taught people the entrepreneurial mindset. And then they began teaching people how to code computers at San Quentin. I also think they're at Folsom now and in, in prisons across the country. But I work with a lot of the guys at the last mile. But while I was in prison, I didn't have any affiliation with them. They're just, in fact, earlier today, I told you I was on a web, web development call. It was actually with Tulio Cardozo, who was also uh, an alumni of CDCR. And he became a computer programmer. Um, but no, my program was all stuff that I created while I was in prison. And it was really with, just with hopes of teaching and inspiring people, well, people like you. And, and it means a lot to me that, that you said somebody introduced you to the book. I wish I would have had it, known that there was an invitation to go to Soledad because I would have taken it up in a heartbeat. Yeah, and, and, and now it, it's slowly coming to mind. Okay, yeah, so we were looking at both of you guys because as soon as you say coding, that, that's – struck my memory. So yeah, we were looking at both of you guys and we were trying to figure out, we were coming across uh, financial and administrative obstacles that prevented us from pursuing uh, uh, either one of those ventures. But um, that's when I was first introduced to-, to um, Earning freedom. Program. Yeah. But, but did you ever get an opportunity to see the program like what we're doing right now, where I'm interviewing formerly incarcerated people and bringing them in onto the uh, CDCR television system? Because that's what I'd like to do with this program. Right. So I'm not exactly sure when you started to televise that, but I do know that CDCR, specifically CTF, was televising um, your series on the institutional station. So I, I did see several of those uh, interviews while it was playing on air. And did those, what impact, what influence did those have on you when you started to see people who went through prison serving either life sentences and came back and became really productive citizens? And, and did that walk me through how you and the other people in prison responded to that messaging? So one, anytime someone from the outside comes in, shows an invested interest, that is very inspiring. It, it offers hope and optimism um, because it, there's a temptation sometimes to think that we're ostracized and that we're forgotten about. So when someone outside shows that interest, that is very inspiring. Um, for me, what I enjoyed about seeing the series was when you and your guests started speaking, you guys were using similar terms, you had similar perspectives, you had similar insights that I had the fortune to being exposed to. So when I'm seeing you guys are being successful, 
it reassured me like, okay, I think I'm on the right path. I'm pretty sure I, I'm getting what I need to get to get outside to be successful. So that's what, it, that's what was good for me. And you've certainly uh, carried that to the nth degree by not only getting out, but getting out and building yourself a career in a professional capacity of serving others. You're really demonstrating what, what servant leadership is all about. Why don't you tell our audience about how much time you served and, and what you've been doing since, when you got out and what you've been doing since you got out? So uh, ultimately, I served a little bit over 16 years. When I got out, I, I paroled to, to L.A., I, I had the fortune because while I was inside, I was a part of a, a very inspiring group of men where we uh, taught ourselves not only uh, collectively, but also academically. And then we were able to get trained vocationally to become alcohol and drug counselors. So uh, some of these guys got out before me and they were tracing, uh, they were blazing a trail and I was able to tap in to their uh, a good work. So as soon as I got out, I was able to call a buddy of mine and I'm all like, Hey, do you know any place where I could actually use my alcohol and drug certification? He was like, why don't you try to come down here and get interviewed? So after about uh, three weeks out, I had a job working in a uh, residential facility as a drug counselor. Since then, um, I, I transitioned over and I'm now working at a detox center. Um, both have been uh, blessings. Um, they both have been inspiring, not only because I've been able to sow value in other people's lives, but they've also sold value into my life. Well, you're really an inspiration to me because you're somebody who went through a life sentence and didn't allow the penitentiary system to completely suck you in. Um, but instead, you've, you, you've managed to come out and, and build yourself a position of leadership out here in society. I uh, follow you on uh, social media and see how productive you are. How long have you been home now? So I was paroled in September, so I'm getting close. I'm, I'm like month 10-ish now. So almost not even a year out, he's already leading a, a career as a, uh, in substance abuse and, and helping other people. And I really want to thank you, Jonathan, for helping our team at Prison Professors by giving us your inspiring story that we could send into people in the CDCR. So thanks so much for spending a Sunday uh, with us. Do you have any final words that you'd like to share with people who are in jail or in prison and how important their, their time is to prepare for success? I would say invest in other people. Um, that is something that is not only fundamentally important to recovery if you are struggling with addiction, but just being a human being walking this human experience, uh, sowing value into someone else. Um, I had the fortune of listening to Danny Trejo the, uh, a couple of days ago because he was generous enough to come out to my small clinic to, to, to speak. And his story was that everything that happened to him was a direct result of him doing something good for somebody else. And that resonates with me because I find that true. Everything that's happened to me is because I've been a part of uh, groups where we are so involved, uh, value in to other people's lives. And that was a testament that proved true when my friend offered me a job. And that's shown true also when I just talked to a buddy who just got out a week ago and he, he thanked me and my friend who got me a job because we both wrote him support letters and he was all like, the board loves your, your guys' letter. And I started laughing because I was all like, really, they actually read our letters? But what he said was the fact that we were giving back to the community and we were willing to give back to him and he had the same capabilities to do the same. They saw that that was something valuable and it improved uh, his suitability. So, um, so in value in other people's life, if, if you do that, good things will come to you and you will actually find an authentic sense of joy in your life. Well, thank you again for spending a Sunday morning with us at Prison Professors. I'm going to send you the CDCR uh, release form so that you could sign it and I could then use this to distribute, to teach and inspire more people inside of jails and prisons and across America. So thank you again, Jonathan. I, I hope that we'll stay in touch 
And I just want you to know I'll do the best that I can to use your story to help more people uh, come out as successfully as you have. Well, I appreciate that. You've been doing a, ph a phenomenal job so far, and I'm pretty sure you'll do an awesome job moving forward. Thank you, Jonathan. All right. Thanks, Mike. Hey, I am Michael Santos, and I want to thank you for the interest that you've shown in the Prison Professors Program. It's really a thrill for me to be able to provide this to CDCR, but I've, I've had a program in there for quite some time, and now I am just starting to supplement those programs by presenting more uh, current information on a regular basis. But it's my understanding that I've got to produce this content in either two segments, either a 28-minute segment or a 58-minute segment. I think that's what it says there. Yeah, 28 or 58-minute segment. I just noticed that my video with Jonathan Barber went longer than 28 minutes. It was actually 35 minutes. So I have an additional 20 minutes of time to record on this video. So I thought I would show you a little tool that I created or that I've just recently begun to create with hopes of using it to teach and inspire more people in prison. And it's actually part of a project that I used while I was going through 26 years in prison. I thought it was really important for me to begin um, really documenting the journey. And so I want to kind of show it to you how it works right here. I don't know if it's going to be available in the CDCR or if it's going to be available uh, provided by CDCR or whether I can get it available in the commissary or uh, your family members can certainly visit it. But first of all, let me show you what it's about and see, you can determine whether this is a tool that is useful for you. Um, because that way, if you have a family member that can go to prisonprofessors.com, they can actually see the product there. But I also think it's important just to share this information so that you will see um, so some of the ways that we have to create our own income streams while we're in society, if you've got a long time in prison. Now, certainly if you, if you know my story, you know that I was in there for 26 years, but while I was in there, I was always thinking about how am I going to come back? And I wanna show you exactly how I do that. Um, so I'm making this video right here on my home computer and working, but I wanna share my screen with you right now. So see, this is the back end uh, of the editing software that I use to record videos. But now I'm gonna pull up, I'm actually sh recording my screen right now. So I'm gonna show you this screen right here. And this is, if you've been in for a long time, you, you may not know a lot about the internet. I certainly didn't know anything about the internet when I went into the system, but I'm gonna show you this tool that I use to, um, that I use as a, uh, uh, as a, to build my business around. So I would just go to the actual website. It's right here, it's called prisonprofessors.com. And if I went to prisonprofessors.com, it's got kind of a slow internet because I'm recording at the same time. This is the business that I use to, with hopes of, of helping more people in jail or prison prepare for a successful uh, return to society. And it's really just a lot of the lessons that I learned. And, and this includes like links to a podcast. So, you know, uh, information that you might, that might be helpful to you if you're about to be sentenced and you're preparing for sentencing, interviews that I do with federal judges. So, so this is what somebody in society would have access to. But I also create uh, content that this is me going inside of jails and prisons and I teach in there. So I'm really just showing you all of this with hopes of, of inspiring you and letting you know that even though you may be serving a lengthy time in prison, you could still be working toward building a life for yourself when you come home. That's what I had to do. So one of my sections on this website here, it says reentry programs. If I click on the Earning Freedom Journal right here, you will see this uh, journal that I created. And this is, I'm teaching here in the San Francisco jail. Um, and if I scroll down, uh, you could actually start to, to see the journal. And this is a video where it describes what it looks like. This is actual a sample page of the journal. Um, every page is going to have a, um, a, a lesson where I'm teaching a little bit about how I learned from people that were 
uh, incarcerated before. Um, some of them I met, some of them I never met. Some of those people were, have been dead for thousands of years, but they nevertheless transformed their lives while they were in prison. And if you've gone through some of my course, you, you probably know that story about Socrates, how he inspired me, or Nelson Mandela, or Malcolm X, or Viktor Frankl, and all of those people. So I, I, I took a lot of lessons from there, and I am offering them through this daily journal. But there's more to this daily journal than just giving a lesson. There's also a vocabulary word because I think it's really important if you're in jail or prison to uh, focus on building your vocabulary. That's something that I actually learned from Malcolm X. If any of you have read the autobiography of Malcolm X, you know that he really uh, transformed his life while he was locked inside of a jail cell. And I read that at the very start of my journey and it inspired me to, to focus on trying to develop stronger communication skills. Then, and this is a sales page, by the way. This is a page that I use for family members who have loved ones in prison so that they can kind of see, hey, these are the strategies that I used to make it through my lengthy journey. And there's something that I would encourage you use as well. You'll notice that every page of the journal, and this is actually a sample page here on the right, every one of the lessons kind of concludes with these critical thinking questions where I'm asking or I'm ta challenging a participant to respond uh, to, to, to how they would be using this journal. And the idea is that they're gonna be filling these, filling this information out and recording their journey. So you see every day has the, the months of the year um, and, and then more critical thinking skills. And then there are two pages of this and I'll actually show you how I designed this and where it, where it exists. But I'm just showing you the sales page because I have to build all of these tools out here um, I use them, I use these to build my business. And through our courses, which I hope to be introducing to uh, people in CDCR, I will be teaching how to build websites like this or what strategies you can use. You can see it's pretty extensive where it also has videos available. If I, um, and the reason I do this is I want somebody who's in prison to be going through the course, but simultaneously I want their family members to have access to it. So everything that that somebody who's working through this journal is using, somebody in society could be accessing for free just by visiting the Prison Professor's page website or the Prison Professor's YouTube channel, which is right here. So if I click here, YouTube is, for those of you who've been in for a long time that may not have access to the internet, um, you can see that I, go to, I, I have a YouTube channel where I publish new content just about every day and I'm always looking here uh, to see who 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 the people, what, what messages they send me. Um, but let me close it here. So this is the YouTube channel. And on this channel, I, I take the time to, to, to um, record videos. These are all videos. A lot of them are with formerly incarcerated people that are going to be part of this program that I'll keep sending into CDCR. Um, others are with business leaders or, or others are me just teaching. But, I'm, but, but here I am actually recording on the videos about the daily journal. So I, I make a video of how I would respond to these questions. One of the things that you, you may have heard me say if, you're, if you've been working through our courses is that I never ask anybody to do anything that I am not doing. And, and so I, I use that information here. And when I get letters from people in prison, because a lot of times they'll write to me, um, I, I can't respond to all of them because I just, I get way too many, you see? I mean, there's just, you know, all, every day there's hundreds of these letters that come and I can't respond to all of them, but I, I do try to look through as many as I can and I'll read them online um, with hopes of trying to bring more awareness to what's going on in the prison system. And, and so this is, you know, these are all tools that I use to try and, and as, I, as, I, as I said from one of my mentors, to be the change that I wanna see in the world. So I wanna teach you guys how to, to create these types of, of products. And even though you, don't have, you may not have access to the internet, just me showing you can, get, can, can broaden your awareness of what's possible. Okay, so before I take you into the back end of this system about what the Daily Journal, let me actually show you what it looks like. And I don't know if I still have it up. If I don't, I will um, create it. I will open it so it's not still up. I was working on it all morning this morning. This here is the back end of a, of a computer screen and these are folders. So if I click on this folder here 
and go to uh, the section where I keep the journal. It's very important to be well organized because as you can see, I've got a tremendous amount of work here. Um, if I at, open this journal right here and go to the January journal, I'm going to be able to show you exactly what it looks like. So this was the August 13th um, version. Today's version, I think is, because I'm always working on this thing, let's just see here. This is interactive. Let's look at the print, let's look at the interactive version. So this is a PDF of the product itself. And this is a journal that I, I thought it was really important to, um, to document every day of my journey when I was going through prison. And I, and I think it's something that's important for, for people who are incarcerated to be doing as well. So there's a new one of these books that comes out every single month. And, and I'm starting in, in the uh, January of 2021. But if you scroll down, you'll see that you know I, I get corporate sponsors to provide funding that allows me to pay for all of this equipment and, and uh, produce this content. Um, but then I have testimonials here from people that have used it across the country, but this is actually what the journal will look like. And I'm just scrolling through the pages right here as I'm being conscious of how much time I have available. I've got about another, I think 15 minutes left on this video. So you scroll through these pages and you eventually get to this little section here where I describe what it is. So I'll just read it to you. The journal participant, the team at Prison Professors created this Earning Freedom Journal series specifically for people in a jail or prison setting. Negative messages permeate the environment of jails and prisons. We encourage the, the pursuit of a self-directed pathway to success. And this interactive journal both teaches and inspires people. I'm going to make this a little bigger so I can read it. Um, the Earning Freedom Journal series includes all of the leadership strategies that empowered me through 26 years in prisons of every security level. My name is Michael Santos. Anyone can use this journal to develop better critical thinking skills and more persuasive communication skills. Use this journal to build strength, restore confidence, and prepare for success. The journals help people navigate challenging times. Leaders taught me the power of keeping personal accountability journals. By making values-based goal-oriented decisions, we can live productively and intentionally regardless of where we may be. By using this strategy, I earned a bachelor's and a master's degree in prisons. Publishers brought books I wrote to consumers. I got married in prison, and together with my wife, I started a publishing company while I was in prison to help others learn the lessons that leaders taught me. As a result of documenting the 9,500 days that I served in prison, many income opportunities opened upon my release. Anyone can use this tool to build higher levels of liberty and prepare for success. One key to success is in documenting the journey. Each page of the journal offers instruction to prepare for personal growth and prosperity. Define success, create a strategy, set priorities, develop tools, tactics, and resources, measure progress every day, execute the strategy to succeed, and use the record of accomplishments to leverage new opportunities. Now, Participants may use this journal interactively. We encourage family members to follow along by visiting the prisonprofessors.com journal or the Prison Professors YouTube channel to see the journal in action. We offer insight and practical steps that anyone can follow to prepare for success while serving a prison sentence. And then we encourage you to visit, um, for, for people in society, visit prisonprofessors.com for more books and courses. So all of this is part of how I build businesses while you know, around my journey. And it's something that I would encourage you to be thinking about if you're going, you know, if you're thinking about how are you going to get out of here? What are you going to do with your life? So here's the actual journal. And you can see it starts off with the day of the, of the week, the day of the year. It's the first day of the year. And there's 364 days remaining. I always considered it important to know where I am. Right, So I want to know where I am at any time in the year. How much more time do I go to reach my goals? You know that um, all of the prison professors courses are really goal-oriented, values-based. We ask you to define success and then set the really clear goals that you can use to um, advance your pathway to success. And so it starts, as I said, with a lesson that looks like this. And then every day includes, you know, every page includes the day of the year. So you can kind of see where you are. And the cool thing about the interactive version, which of course you wouldn't have access to if you're in prison, but you could get it online, is if I click on these links, they will take you directly to where I want uh, the, the visitor to go. So you've got to learn if you want to be in the digital marketing business or, or the business of, of, um, 
uh, you know, connecting with society and consumers, you, you, you have to learn how to do all of these things. And I will be teaching that, uh, these courses exactly how I do it. I don't expect that you're going to, it's, you know, you're going to be able to do it without practicing. It's kind of like, you know, reading books about tennis that doesn't necessarily is going to make you a tennis player. But if I can show you how I use these tools, um, at least you'll become a little bit more literate. You know, you'll understand a little bit more about how to work them. But this is, you know, really what the journal is all about. And then, and then each day it has a series of sections where you where you could be um, documenting your journey. And so, you know, this this takes you through the entire month of January. So there's about twenty thousand words in here. So it's effectively like a um, each one of these is like having your own book. But I'm asking you to write your book as well. So at the end of the month, you're going to have this this um, document that kind of shows what you're doing. And that's something that, that, that Jonathan Barber was speaking about in the interview that preceded this monologue I'm giving you right now, is he spoke about the importance of thinking about when you're going to see at the board and expressing your identification with other people and try and help other people. Well, this could become a very useful tool. Imagine going to the board and if you served, say, 10 years in prison, you would have 12 of these books filled out for every year because there's one of these for every month of the year with lessons and, and, and then you're documenting your journey. And imagine you're going before the board and you take, uh, you know, you'd have 120 of these where you've really shown how hard you've worked to prepare for success. So that's one of the reasons that I created this is because I know how helpful <clears throat> it was going to be to me while I was in prison. It was very helpful for me to be thinking about, okay, what am I going to do when I get out of here? And how am I going to build relationships with people that, that, can, that can help me grow? Um, just so you know, I know I've got 10 more minutes left before my time expires with you today. So I'm pretty conscious of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the window here. But now let me show you um, on the website what I've been creating, what I've been working with. And I, and I always work with, I try to work with formerly incarcerated people. So this morning I was working with Tulio Cardozo, who's really an amazing guy um, and, and, and is a leader, has a leadership position with The Last Mile. Tulio served, I think, about seven years in state prison in California. And he trained himself on how to become uh, fluent in computers while he was at San Quentin and later became very active with the Last Mile program. And so together we have been working on this program right here, which is a sales page. Um, and I just want to walk you through how the whole thing goes. So we've got, this is the back end of what's called a WordPress website. And this is my website um, called Prison Professors. And on this back end, I publish all types of content. Um, I can, but we, we recently installed this plugin right here. And this plugin allows me to build these things that are called landing pages. And this is the Earning Freedom Journal pre-order because I'm filming this in August of 2020 for distribution in January of 21. So if I go to the edit page of this document, you'll see that I have these different series of things that are happening. One is a landing page. One is a checkout uh, page, but this is all automatic and I'm going to walk you through it. And then there's a five book discount upsell page. I'll walk you through that. There's a two book discount downsell page. And then there's the thank you page. Now, all of this is tracked on the back end of this system. So if I go to view this page, I can open it in a different link right here and you're seeing it's loading right now. It's a little slower because I'm simultaneously recording while I'm, I'm also uh, working on the back end of a website. So this is what the landing page will look like. So I can buy media on Facebook or Google and drive people to this page where they can read all about the daily journal that teaches and inspires people in jail or prison. And it says daily lessons to learn, critical thinking patterns, vocabulary building questions. Um, and then it's got a little information here. Um, there's a lot of places you'll see this link here and that's to buy the, uh, the book itself. But let's just scroll down because these people don't know who I am. They don't know anything about me. They're just, they, they may have clicked on an ad and they're coming here, but this is how I build a business. Okay. That's uh, 
trying to build authority with the customer, get the customer to know that I'm authentic and I'm never asking anybody to do anything that I didn't do. So there's, again, where I'm, I'm showing them what it looks like, okay? But let's say they've read it all, they've, they've watched some of the videos, there are videos here. Um, they can, you know, this is a sample of a video of what it looks like. And let's just say, God, I would like to order that for my, you know, wife who's in prison or my son who's in prison. And so they click the order page and there you have a, a complete order form. And I can try to just go ahead and order a page. I don't think I can order it because I am a, um, you know, I'm the author, but you would just plug in your, your, your shipping information. And then um, you see, I, I've got it here at a pre-order price of only $15 if they order, you know, in advance of the year. Um, and they place the order, boom, see what, I, I probably didn't give my credit card. So yeah, it's, okay, so it's not allowing me to do it because I, I didn't give them my credit card and I've got to give them my credit card. But what would happen if they went next, let's see, the next page in the flow they would go to would be this section right here. And as soon as they entered their credit card, they would come up with this discount. I'm trying to sell them on some of my other books. So I would say, wait, here's a special offer to go to this page and they could buy all of my books um, or all of these books. These are five books, Earning Freedom, which of course tells the story of my whole journey, Prism 8,344th day. Um, and that's about how you get through one day. Success is the story of how I um, you know, built my business since I, when I came home from prison. And then this is the whole straight A guide uh, concept. And then there's a newer course that I have here, which is 10 steps to prepare for success from jail or prison. And you can add that to your order. I've got to film a video, which I'll be doing a little bit later today for this page. I just built this today, truly, and I built this early this morning. Um, but I wanted you to see it and then see after, after you go through it, they come to this thank you page and they can download the sample chapter. See if they click right here, there's the order details are gonna show up right there. They can just download it by clicking this button. So a family member can get it for free after they've sent it to their loved one in prison. So um, anyway, pretty enthusiastic about this product. I thought it would be something that would be of interest to you. If you're in a jail or a prison, I thought it would be of interest to you to be able to see one of the new products that I'm creating and how I build a business around it. And uh, I just wanted to share that since I had a little extra time with you before uh, this video expired. Um, my commitment to you is I will continue working to try and get as much content as I can into the California Department of Corrections. I know that you need regular content to stay inspired while you're in there. Um, and uh, I'll do my best to to bring, to bring it, just like I brought it here with Jonathan Barber, either well, I'm going to be interviewing formerly incarcerated people who came back successfully. I'll be interviewing business leaders who give us different concepts about how to prepare for success, or um, I'll be sharing stories myself. Um, that's what the Prison Professors Program is all about. If you've got a loved one inside, outside that kind of is, follows along with you, you might encourage them to visit our YouTube channel at Prison Professors so they can kind of see the information that we are sending inside jails and prisons and they can take a look at some of the books and the courses that we are creating with hopes of helping more people inside prepare for a successful outcome. So I think that pretty much 23 minutes and I had 35 minutes, 35, 45, 55. Yeah, I'm about it. That's about it for my time. So be cool. <laughs> I'll be back with more content soon. Bye-bye.